um, utilizing the space correctly. So please do feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. You can find that by going to the bar at the bottom of your screen and clicking the chat icon while using the Q&A feature for any questions. So that is also at the bottom of your screen. So just type in your questions and hit send and we will cover those at the end of today's presentation. Lastly, if there are any questions about how to utilize Zoom or if you're having any problems, please feel free to reach out to me as the moderator. My name is Noor Saraki. I'm our Invasive Species Coordinator. By going into the chat and sending a message to the VBCD moderator help individual, that is me, and I'll do my best to help clean up whatever issues you are having. With that, thank you for joining us. Uh, this has been such a great presentation um, a week of presentations that we have had here and it's been a fantastic experiment to have you all along with us for it. Uh, if there are any questions of course put those in the chat but without any further ado I would like to introduce today's speaker. Crystal York is WMU's Office of, for Sustainability Project Coordinator and a PhD student in electrical engineering. She's been working at the office since 2018 and has led the composting program since 2019. With the help of her staff and other collaborators at WMU, she has been able to grow this program from a few vermicomposting bins where you're composting with worms to a large scale aerated static pile that's able to compost all pre-consumer food waste from the largest dining center on campus. And with that, I would like to pass over to Crystal. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hello. Um, yes, uh, my name is Crystal, like she said. And yeah, so I compost a lot at the Office for Sustainability at the Gibbs House site. Um, and I can start sharing the presentation um, that I have prepared for this there we go. Everyone can see it, I think. Um, yeah, so the Gibbs House um, composting at the Gibbs House originally kind of started out in 2008, mostly with studies about it and food evaluations from the food waste coming out of the dining center, um, a lot of reducing food waste from the dining centers. And then there were some vermicomposting studies where there were small scale um, and then static piles have always been around where we just dump all our, um, cause we also do a lot of gardening at the Gibbs house. So static piles just for dumping our compost into those. Um, and then we've been growing um, from there. There was a compost heat, hot water heat recovery system where we st uh, strung tubes around the compost bin and used the hot water in our hoop houses. Um, and yeah, we've even done, I wasn't here for this study, but we've done black soldier fly larvae composting. So I read a little bit about that and it was in partnership with Bell's Brewery, which was pretty cool. Um, and then in spring 2019, they decided to like grow that. So that's kind of where I came in. Um, I was originally hired for our aquaponics system, but then we put that to sleep because it was kind of an older project. And then we started this composting. So um what is composting so composting is the aerobic um decomposition of organic materials so aerobic meaning it requires oxygen and so a lot of times people will mix up the system with big windrow turners or what we're trying to do so it's less so we didn't need one of those big windrow turners um we're trying to um include pumping air under the system, but I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, so, and then the, the um, organic materials are decomposed by um, the microorganisms into nutrient rich natural fertilizer. Um, so if um, there's a lot of benefits, which I'll also go into each one of these bullet point benefits, um, but if your compost is emitting bad odor, um, like rotten eggs, it's too wet. And if it, and it wasn't mixed thoroughly and a well-constructed compost pile doesn't actually smell bad at all. In fact, it emits a refreshing earthy aroma. So that's kind of what we're going for here, a nice um, decent smelling uh, compost pile. And I will go over how you can accomplish that. Oh, I think I went, yep. Uh, so, um, 
what can you compost? Um, you can compost all the things listed here. And um, so you can compost most organic materials. Uh, the most common food waste to compost is fruits and veggies, as well as tea leaves, coffee grounds, coffee filters, and egg and nut shells. But you can compost um, other things more than just what comes out of your kitchen, like a lot of paper products, cardboard. Um, you can compost manure as well, uh, which sounds gross, but many farmers that have barnyard animals compost the manure from those animals and use it on their crops. Um, so um, you have to be careful with composting manure though because of the potential health risks, but um, so we don't do that. Uh, we concentrate on the food that's coming out of our dining halls, but a lot of farmers will compost manure. Um, so what can't you compost? Um, some of the big no-nos for the compost bin are glass, metal, plastics. These are what are known as contaminants in a compost pile and should be strictly thrown out or recycled depending on what it is. Um, you know those stickers on banana peels, uh, you don't, oh sorry, you don't want um, those stickers, you gotta peel those off, throw them away, they usually have a plastic film on those stickers. Um, um, so you also probably don't want to throw bones in there. If you think about bones, they take a long time to compost, so no bones. Um, things that are more difficult to compost, meat, dairies, fats, oils, um, those usually just take longer to compost or like they smell really bad so people don't normally throw those in. It is possible, but it's very hard. And then um, weeds are the last thing I put on the list of difficult, probably don't want to because if you don't heat up your pile hot enough, um, the weed seeds will stick around and then you'll put the compost in your garden and then you just have weed seeds in there. So weeds can be hard, but you can do it if the pile gets warm enough. All right, so um, building recipes. So I'm gonna be using a lot of carbon and nitrogen um, or green and brown. So the greens are nitrogen. That just means they have a higher, um, higher amount of nitrogen in them. Everything has carbon, we're made of carbon. Foods partially made of carbon, obviously. But um, these things in the green pile are higher in nitrogen and you need that nitrogen and carbon um, to come together. And so, um, so the greens are the food scraps, vegetable scraps, um, coffee grounds. Those are all things we consider our greens. And then our browns are leaves, wood chips, twigs. We mostly use wood chips um, here at the, at the Gibbs site. Um, but if you're doing a vermicomposting, they usually like just nice shredded paper um, for their bedding. Um, so um, recipe building, the suggested carbon to nitrogen or browns to green ratio is 30 to one. Um, usually how I think about it is just about one bucket of carbon to one bucket of nitrogen. And that's just easier to think about. But if you go to this um, helpful calculator um, at the bottom and you know what you're composting, you can just type in, I'm composting, um, I wanna use wood chips as my carbon and food scraps as my greens, and they'll give you a more exact ratio. Um, but most of the time you can just tell by practice and looking at it, um, if there's too much carbon, it will decompose much slower. And if there's too much nitrogen, the pile will smell really bad. And then all you have to do is if it's smelling really bad, add more carbon. Um, that's, that's about it. Um, so once you have all the correct carbon to nitrogen ratio, um, the micro and macro organisms will live and thrive. And, um, and uh, all of these microorganisms listed here are important in the process and they all play a role in it. It gets a little more into biology, um, which I don't know too much about, but um, I know they're all important in the process and the bigger ones can eat the smaller ones, but the smaller ones are always around like bacteria and fungi are the main, main part of what's helping you um, break down the food 
and they all require oxygen to stay alive. Um, so feedstock preparation, um, you can either, you can do two techniques. Um, the the uh, larger, the bigger technique is a batch compost pile um, where you're saving up a lot of food waste. And this is what we've been doing when we're composting the food waste from the Valley Dining Center, our dining center on campus. We have a lot of food waste at once, so we can do a batch style compost. And that's pretty convenient because you can, um, comp it takes um, a short amount of time. You think it's kind of counterintuitive, um, but because you have so much food waste, it heats up more and then it breaks down faster. Uh, the other type is an add-as-you-go pile, which um, vermicomposting or composting with worms is the number one add-as-you-go pile type method for people. Um, so the pros is it's, oh, oh sorry, we have a cat. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> um, add-as-you-go, um, vermicomposting, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, Anyways, uh, the bedding is shredded paper. You wanna moisten the bedding, um, add worms, and then bury all your food scraps. I usually do about a handful of food scraps every week, and that's enough depending if you have about, if you buy a pound of worms. You can buy worms online and they deliver them right to your door. Um, but if you buy a pound of worms, it's about a handful of food scraps a week. And that usually works really well for someone living in an apartment. Um, so tips for any pile, um, moisture level is important. You want to keep it moist enough where if you picked up a handful of the bedding or the, when it starts breaking down more, pick up a handful of compost and squeezed it, maybe like one drop would come out. Um, other things um, that are optional are, I know a lot of people sometimes ask me about activators. Uh, I've never used them, but you can buy them online and they're just like a batch of bacteria and fungi that you already need for your compost pile. And it, I heard it just breaks down your pile faster. Um, you can cover your pile to maintain the moisture and the heat. Um, so I usually cover it with a tarp if it's outside, um, sometimes burlap sacks, um, and then it keeps the moisture and heat all intact in the pile. Um, you should still ensure proper airflow like I do. It's the arid static pile, which like I said, there's a slide all about it and I'll go over that. Um, and then check your temperatures. Usually you want to, um, it, I, not everyone has a temperature sensor, but usually you can feel the heat coming off of it and that's pretty good level. And then you wanna mix it every once in a while. Um, especially if you have a small pile, usually just flip it over every once in a while and it'll be good. Um, so just to talk about a little bit of the benefits, um, soils are important for life, soil is important for food, and we need to do a better job of maintaining the nutrients in our soil. So and just um, you want that dark, spongy, nice composting soil, um, and that's just important for all the microbiology um, that you want, need for your plants to stay alive. This, they will, the, the microbiology, the healthy soil also keeps weeds away. Um, it, the plants can outcompete the weeds better um, and it keeps diseased bacteria away. The good bacteria outcompete the diseased ones when you have nice enriching soil. Um, saves landfill space, this one's a little obvious. Um, last time I looked into the data, about 50% of the garbage we throw away um, could be compostable, either food or paper or yard trimmings. Um, about 50% could be compostable. Um, decreases greenhouse gases. So a lot of times when you throw food scraps away, if it's covered, it'll produce ammonia. And um, that's the CH4, I meant methane. It produces methane. And the CH4 um, is even a little bit, it's even worse than um, CO2 carbon dioxide um, in reference to greenhouse gases. Um, so we want to decrease those obviously. Um, and then improves water quality and saves water. So the soil, like I said, it's like a sponge almost and it keeps the water 
where you want it to be. It doesn't just run off the soil, it keeps it in your soil so your plants can live and thrive. Um, oh, and creates jobs. I looked into this a little bit and you could create more jobs with composting. Um, and that's cool. I mean, it creates my job, so there you go. <laughs> Um, and now to go into the different methods of composting, which I kind of went over. I mentioned some of them, but I can talk about them a little bit more. Um, vermicomposting, composting with worms. You can do, we have a larger scale vermicomposting outside in our hoop house. A hoop house is like a greenhouse, but plastic. Um, so you could do it outside. We buried it in the ground to keep them warm. Um, and they stay alive all winter long, or a lot of people do vermicomposting inside. Um, I have a bin like right behind me. It doesn't smell. I've eaten right next to it. Um, so that's usually what I suggest people to um, do um, if they have not a lot of room, if they have an apartment. I, I vermicompost in my apartment. It's fine. Um, and then, yeah, like I said, here's a bunch of other lists of composting methods. Um, so like the stat pile, you just use it to collect our yard waste, but you could make a static pile with food waste as well. Um, I, like I was talking about our outdoor vermicomposting bin. Um, we, in the summer of 2019, um, we collected about uh, 152 pounds of vermicomposting from um, this bin and we would just give it out to um, People, um, we have a community garden, we gave out some to them. I've given it out to um, students and then we use some at our Gibbs House site. Oh, and we gave it to our on-campus greenhouse, some as well. Um, so I was talking about the indoor vermicomposting. I used to have five things had to do with the COVID one. Um, we didn't get just throw away the worms. We put it in our outdoor vermicomposting bin and someone checked up on that every once in a while. Um, so food, our lasagna bed. So we have a food forest. Um, it's like a permaculture site here at the Gibbs house. And we made these lasagna beds. So it's kind of um, like the static piles where we will compost yard waste. And so at the end of the growing season, we put um, hay and some smaller branches in there. It decomposes over the winter. And then we have soil already ready in these spots to grow in the spring. Um, and we have a bunch of store-bought bins, which I go over in a video that you can see. Um, and I, and if anybody wants, I have links to all these bins. So if you see one that you really want, uh, you can ask me. Um, these are good if you have like a backyard and you wanna keep everything contained. Um, so we have some of these store-bought bins. Um, yeah, and then aerated static pile, the one that I love and I do a lot of. Um, so you basically use PVC pipes or um, some other manifold and you pump air into the system. And this um, is easier um, on you because you don't have to mix the pile as much. It feeds the air into the system automatically. Um, we have it on a timer, so it turns on for maybe a minute every hour. Um, and that's usually about enough. And then we had a version one where it was really small scale um, and it was just in this white bin, no turning needed, like I said. Um, then uh, with a biology grad student, um, I, um, we made four separate piles, two were aerated static piles and one were regular static piles. Um, and we track the temperature, the moisture, the oxygen levels, the pH. And I haven't gotten all the data back from her yet because we finished this a couple months ago and she's doing her thesis on it, um, but we will see. And we got all the food waste from one of our dining centers. Um, and then the final pile I already built but recently, like it just uh, finished built building it like uh, last week, I think. Um, so I should have included some actual pictures of it. Um, oh, and I meant to mention that the blower um, is a, just a standard um, bouncy house blower. Uh, that's what everyone who makes an aerated static pile, that's what they normally buy. Um, so if you think of those child bouncy houses getting blown up with that, that's what I use. Um, and I got the funding from a grant that 
we have our campus for sustainability ideas from students. Um, the blower is solar powered and I track everything with the wireless temperature sensor and the moisture sensor and I send the soil in to be tested by um, Michigan State University. And sometimes our biology department will test our soil at Western, um, but since COVID they haven't been able to. Uh, but we did have a class come out once and um, test some of our vermicomposting as like an undergrad course. And that was pretty cool. Um, so we with landscape facility management. I mentioned dining services a lot. Um, I said the biology department and um, we used to have a, what we called a Bronco bucket programs where we gave a bunch of departments a bucket and we would collect them, but COVID stopped that sadly. Maybe we'll start it after. Um, oh, and a lot of support. I didn't mean to put this slide on there, but there's a bunch of quotes of support. Um, overall goals, um, help the environment decrease WMU's uh, carbon footprint and um, compost, decrease the amount of food waste going to the landfills are the top had like top line goals. Uh, yeah, just some ideas of what you can do. You can compost at home. We have volunteer hours every Friday, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. And um, yeah. And this is, like I said, volunteering. We have an open bike shop. This is just all of our resources. I didn't update the workshop. Some of these have already done, um, but yeah. Any questions? Um, I also have, I know I went through everything pretty fast. Um, and I have a video as well that talks even more about the composting process. Um, I didn't mean to go through everything that fast, uh, but don't worry, the video is about 13 minutes long. So you'll get more composting information and I can answer questions right now. Yeah, I think, thank you so much. That was fantastic. I think <laughs> with where we are in time right now, let's jump right into the video and then we can do questions afterwards. Okay. Let's see. Let me start from the beginning and here we go. I'm not hearing the audio. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. Oh, it might be. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, think it might cause... be coming through your speakers, not from the video. Yep. It's coming from. Yeah, that's why it was so. Okay, I hope you all. Maybe straight from my laptop. <laughs> Here. <laughs> so now that we have some fruit or veggie scraps what else do we need well our fruit and veggies are known as our green source or our nitrogen source and so we need about an equal amount of browns or a carbon source that can be wood chips hay leaves, paper, shredded paper, uh, cardboard, anything like that. Um, so today we have... No! So what we might be able to do, um, if you can give us a link to this video, we can send it out to attendees later this afternoon um, and just go straight into questions now, if that would work. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Oh, no <laughs> worries. There's always something. And I apologize that it had to happen during yeah. your <laughs> during your round as our speaker. Um, so again, everyone, if you do have questions, uh, please go ahead and enter those into the Q and A form. But we can just jump right into a few questions that were already sent. Um, so first off, we had someone in the chat ask you to speak on using compost tea as fertilizers, and from the context of the question, in specifically reference to using it as a yard or grass fertilizer in ecologically sensitive areas. So in 
opposition to um, traditional chemical fertilizers for lawn environments. Yeah. Um, so I have um, actually made a compost um, tea uh, fertilizer making thing. Uh, yes, I've done compost tea before. Um, and I did it in a 50 gallon barrel. Um, you, as long as you are aerating it enough, um, and that can be um, any aquaponics type aerator, that's what I was using. Um, as long as you aerate enough, it will it'll be fine as a natural um, fertilizer. A lot of people are worried about um, it going, going anaerobic and that's why you gotta pump air into it. Um, so yeah, I think I mean, it's fine near, near a lake shore, um, especially like it's definitely better than harmful chemicals. Um, but yeah, so I had a, I had um, the, a PVC pipe going into it and a, a ring around the bottom. Um, and I just looked up one that could be made um, a, a, an outline of it online. Um, I could find that if you want it and if you want to send it out. Um, but the ring of air around the bottom and then there was also one that would go into like a tube that went into the bag um, that you would put the compost in and then you just dip it in there. I would tie it around the tube and then I would aerate it a lot. And I think it might've been like a week on a weekly basis. It might've been, a, I think that's just what I did. I think you could do less than that. You could do it in one day. Um, but yeah, I did it on a weekly basis. Okay, awesome. Um, Additionally, when looking at the internal temperatures of compost, is it, is there a threat of like combustion or what are the internal temperatures that we can look for or any possible dangers of the temperatures that can be reached in those piles? Yeah, um, so normally you want pretty hot temperatures. Um, they suggest above 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so, and not above 160. And the 160 is just a thing they suggest not to go above because um, if you get it that hot, uh, it starts killing off the helpful um, bacteria and fungi and you don't wanna kill them. Um, so uh, yeah, somewhere around 140 is usually good. It will kill all the weed seeds, but it won't kill all the helpful bacteria and fungi. And all you have to do to keep that temperature down and lower is like mix it a lot. Um, and you can also decrease the temperature probably by adding, I mean, adding um, uh, like not insulating it as well. So like I, like, especially in the winter, I try to insulate my piles as much as possible to get them to that higher temperature. Um, but if you just have it open um, so it can let out all the heat um, but there's no, I, I've never heard of anyone really worried about combustion, <laughs> um, but um, because 140 is usually the temperature you're aiming for and you're like really hoping for, but sometimes it doesn't get that, even that hot. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I hope that awesome. answered the question. Absolutely. Um, so we have a question. Last fall, we started a compost pile on a cement slab. Does this affect how my pile will compost? We use leaves, greens, kitchen scraps, added worms, scrap paper, and we re regularly turn. Um, I think a, like a cement slab is fine. Um, yeah, it shouldn't, uh, sometimes maybe if it's too wet, the water will run off of it, obviously. Um, but I, I don't see any problem with the cement slab. I've done it on grass. I've done it on wood. I've done it in a plastic bin. Um, and I think I've, I've seen other people do it on cement slabs and there's no problem with that. I wouldn't really worry about it. Yeah. Okay. Did I answer awesome. the question? <laughs> yeah. I think just if there are any particulars with like composting on impervious surfaces as opposed to like yeah. on grass or something like that, if there's yeah, anything they so should go for. I think it's actually like even some people get worried about it going into the grass and into like 
if there's groundwater nearby. So mm -hmm. sometimes people are even looking for that um, cement slab to compost on. So there's less worries of that. I would just make sure um, you cover it if it gets too rainy, because then you'll have like a lot of runoff water. And especially if there's something nearby um, that you don't want that runoff water to go into. But um, other than that, I, I don't see any problem with it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, could you please, in your presentation, if you can bring that back up, um, yeah. go back to the chart that has the ratios between brown and green and talk yeah. a little bit more about those ratios and how to achieve that in our own systems. Yes, yeah. So um, it's kind of like a math problem, um, <laughs> which is everyone's favorite subject. <laughs> um, so um, I can send, what I can do is if you really want to be specific, I can send you this link and it goes through step by step of what you have to do. And it already has some of the, it already has these pre-recorded. Um, so you just have to select from a drop down menu. Um, and then it'll tell you the exact ratio and it usually gives it by volume. Um, so, but to simplify everything, I usually tell people that it's fine to start off with just one bucket of nitrogen, one bucket of food, and one bucket of carbon source, like um, wood chips, hay. Um, and that's, that works, that has never not worked for me, basically. Um, so sometimes I have to, um, if I, if it's not decomposing properly, um, or slowly, I mean, if it's decomposing slowly, I know in my mind that this pile needs more food. Um, if it's very smelly, you just pile more wood chips on it or more hay and then maybe mix it around so the hay and wood chips are on there. And then you always want, I don't think I really mentioned this, but to keep down the smell, you always want about three um, to five inches of whatever, um, whatever carbon source you're using on top of your pile, a nice layer of carbon sources on your pile. Um, and that will keep the smell down. And it will also make sure your pile is always covered with carbon um, because when it's your pile's decomposing, it usually decreases in size, um, especially if you're getting that heat up there. Um, and when it decreases in size, sometimes the food starts poking out and then um, it attracts pests and it smells, it starts smelling a little bit more. So if you have that nice three to five inches of wood chips, it usually covers it. Um, but going back to your original question, carbon to nitrogen ratios, I can send this link to the chat. That would be fantastic. Copy it. Yeah. So oh, from my understanding, when we're starting out, when we're looking at the carbon to nitrogen ratio, the nitrogen sources are more so going to be our like food sources or food waste. And then we want to kind of even that out with our carbon sources, which would mm -hmm. be more so like the yard waste paper products, that kind of thing, correct? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, and then like for a smaller vermicomposting system, it would be like, um, you wanna see it's a little different because you wanna start off with a full bedding for the worms. Um, so I usually just fill it up all the way like to the, like as much as I can um, in the bin and then um, and then wet the bedding, then add the worms. And then I'll add like a handful of food waste at a time. So that's not like a 50, 50, cause you're adding a lot of bedding. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it will eventually balance out to 50, 50 because from then on you're pretty much only adding food scraps. You can add more paper. If it starts to smell, I would add more paper, um, but, and always wet it cause they like the worms like it moist. Um, mm -hmm. So that's a little different because you're not adding 50-50 right away. You're adding a lot of bedding and then a handful of food scraps. Um, but okay. over time, more food, it'll balance out. Fantastic. Um, so when we're looking for activators, um, we have a question. Since Ribex breaks down solids, can this be used as an activator in compost piles? Ribex. Oh, I... 
like I said, I've never used activators before, so I can't really speak to it too much. Um, but breaks down solids. What what is RibX? <laughs> I myself am not familiar. I can yeah. try to look that up, uh, and we can revisit this question. One thing yeah. that I had a question on is if we were looking, if someone was looking to start um, those lasagna beds in like a backyard garden context, what would their timeline look like? Um, from starting the bed, would it be like an August, September to being able to plant in a spring? Uh, yeah, it definitely depends on what you put in there. So if you put a lot of thick twigs, they're not going to break down right away. Um, but if you put a lot of um, wood chips, shredded stuff, um, hay breaks down a little faster. Sometimes hay can be annoying though. Um, and if you, um, yeah, if you started in August, yes, it's as long as you have a lot of shredded stuff in there, it should break down by the spring. Um, we have what we have done is sometimes we started even later in October and then we just have to, it breaks down a little bit, but not completely. And so we pull out all the big stuff and then add more dirt or fill it up the rest of the way. Um, so you just gotta balance it. Um, shredded um, like sawdust usually um, activates the pile, heats it up and like it's definitely um, add some carbon source to it and um, it's already broken down a lot so it'll break down really fast if you have any like sawdust um, and then wood shavings as well it's very is very good stuff but normally we just put yard waste in our piles and then take out all the big stuff that doesn't decompose okay fantastic um Karen, I wasn't able to find anything specific. I think there's still some confusion on what was meant by your question. If you could please clarify that, that would be great. Um, and we can come back to that. I did have one other question in terms of vermicomposting. So from an invasive species perspective, which is what I do, worms aren't native to Michigan and actually can cause some pretty significant problems in our wooded environments and sugar maples, for instance, struggle. Um, in forests where worms have been introduced. So when we are introducing compost produced through vermiculture, what are the best ways to ensure and we're kind of keeping our worms where we want them um, without introducing them to new areas? Yeah, yeah. So um, we, us personally, because we only have one bin and it's really like, there's not too many worms. I mean, there's mm -hmm. more all the time because they do produce more, um, they make babies yep. in there. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, we just hand pick them out. We like spread out the compost all over like a, a special table that we use and pick out the worms and put them back. Um, uh, yeah, other than that, um, I we've also used like a chicken wire ring thing mm. um, to, and we have this setup where it goes over a wheelbarrow and um, it like, we have it spinning. Um, it's hard to describe without like showing it, um, but it's like a chicken wire tube and we put the compost in there and spin it. And it like sifts out the, um, sifts it out. But also a lot of time, most of the time the worms just stay on the wiring and some mm -hmm. fall. And, but we always like, we'll pick them out at the bottom, pick them out. And it, it kind of like sifts through the compost faster that way. So we have that as well to do it a little faster. So basically chicken wire, throw the worms on there. They'll get stuck on the chicken wire, pick them out. Okay. Um, that's another thing. You don't have to have that ring thing. You could just have a flat panel of chicken wire um, and throw it on there over like a wheelbarrow or another barrel and then pick them out that way. That's much easier and I prefer that way. <laughs> okay, and, yeah, like panning yeah. for gold. Yeah, like <laughs> sifting, yeah. <laughs> okay. Fantastic. Um, I think another question that I would have is in your experience with some of those like commercial 
rotary bins yeah. or the other ones that you may have in your backyard. What are the things that you have learned you like in those and the one th- the things that you would avoid when trying to figure out which one to purchase for a home situation? Yes. So I, in that video, went through every single bin and I wish it was working, but my bad. I will definitely send that to everybody. It's, it's a pretty cute video. And I basically use it as a semi-instructional like so you can actually see me composting and also Mm -hmm. I review each and every bin so if you're interested in buying one of those backyard bins I would definitely watch that video um and if you want to visualize how composting is I would watch that as well um but um so there's basically on the market there's mostly just tumbling bins where they turn in a circle which is good for aerating um but it's they're hard to insulate in the winter because they're usually off the ground um but what i look for is i like our my favorite one is actually the one made out of metal that we have because it's sturdy it's got a nice mechanism for turning and like i said i can send the links to every single um one i already have an email made out of every single one um But then there's different sizes too. So we have like this smaller tumbler that I would suggest if you're like either one or two people living there and you don't produce a lot of food waste. Um, So you're also looking for the size. Um, And I also talk about which ones were easier to set up. Um, So there were two that were very difficult to put together. And if you were doing that on by yourself, it might be impossible. Um, So I would definitely stay away from the hardest ones to put together. And then there were ones where it was like two pieces, you clipped them on, it was basically done. Like, I really liked those. Um, And then we have one store-bought bin that's not a tumbler. Um, And they just, like I said, that one was, it was like five pieces, snap, 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 done. And it just goes on the ground, you feed it, and that's it. I like that one because since it's on the ground, easier to insulate, it warms up more. Um, Anything that's on the ground will stay warmer and um, be warmer just next to the earth. It just gets warmer. Um, So that's why I like the ones that are on the ground and uh, compared to the tumblers, but the tumblers are good because they're easy to aerate. Um, So yeah, like I said, definitely watch that video. It's really cute. (laughs) And it reviews every single bin that we have. Oh, and there's one other bin. Um, If you just want, if you're just worried about um, not throwing away your food waste and you're not as worried about like um, having the end compost product and you just want a way to dispose of your food waste in a better way, there's a bin that you can dig into the ground and it's pretty much stays permanent in the ground and then you feed the food waste in there and then it um it slowly decomposes and like goes into the ground basically I'm not exactly sure how it never fills up but it really doesn't um and if it did ever get like too full you would have to like dig it out again um Mm -hmm. but we've had it for a while and we haven't had to do that yet um so that's a good way of just letting the compost go into the soil (laughs) (laughs) semi-magically. Okay, fantastic. Um, Yeah, that's that's kind of a review of all the bins. I definitely, especially if you're more eco-minded, I liked the metal one. It did have some plastic on the edge and the handle was made of plastic, but it was like sturdy. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like the metal one. (laughs) Fantastic. I will absolutely be looking forward to that video because I think it can be overwhelming trying to figure out what system is kind of the best fit Um, a reminder please do keep sending in your questions if you have any otherwise i am just going to continue to dominate your time Mm -hmm. (laughs) with some of my own but i do want to just keep this conversation going because i think this is fantastic information um one thing that i know we often get questions about are um compostable products that are probably made more so for like an industrial composting situation. So Mm -hmm. things like um, the corn-based plastics, for instance, in flatware. Um, Have you had any success getting to temperatures in these size piles to deal with those? Or is that something that we still are 
unable to manage on that scale. Yeah. So really all of you're looking for, for those things is to get it hot enough. So if you are getting to that 140, 150, um, you can compost those. Um, because we just started our bigger aerated static pile, um, we had, we did throw a couple of the, like, if you ever seen those green, like plastic looking, but they're compostable bags. Um, those are thinner and easier than the corn based, like plastic containers. Um, so I did throw a couple of those in there and we'll see if it breaks down. Um, but like I said, really, you're just, the reason they say industrials, like people can compost it is because usually smaller scale systems can't get hot enough. Um, so if you're getting warm enough, you should be able to compost them, but it could take long. It, it'll definitely take longer than all your food waste. Um, so you would just have to, if you're nearing the end, you sift it out, you can sift out um, the compost and you still have like maybe some of those scraps, you can throw it back in there and just try it again because it will probably take a little longer than everything else. Or you can um, just keep feeding the same pile. Um, but most of the time you want to pull out all your already done compost and start over because that's how everything warms up again. Um, if you keep the same compost in there, normally it stays kind of um, not as warm as you need it. Um, so especially if you're looking for those higher temperatures, you wanna keep restarting a pile. Uh, I hope that answered the question. <laughs> no, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, with that, it looks like we do not have any other questions. And I just want to pop up some information really quick for everyone. Thank you again, everyone, for taking part in this Backyard Symposium series. Thank you so much, Crystal, for setting aside your time and coming and talking with us today. It was super informative, and I really appreciated it. Um, we will be getting out that video when we send everything out later next week. Um, and thank you, attendees. This was kind of an experiment for us. We didn't really know what we were getting into, and the response has been fantastic. So we really do appreciate that. As always, you can sign up for our newsletter or ask any questions via the contact form on our website. Uh, please do look out for an email from us next week. We will be sending out a link to all of the recordings from this, which will be hosted on our YouTube channel, as well as a survey. This is the first time we've done a webinar series at the district. It's the first time that we've kind of delved more deeply into this backyard habitat and management education. And so we really do appreciate your feedback to better understand how we can serve our community and get you valuable information. So keep a lookout for an email from us next week with the videos and that survey link. And as always, please do follow us on Facebook so that you can keep up to date on what we may be offering. Yes, Crystal. Um, I have uh, a YouTube link to the video ready so I can put it in the um, chat for everybody. Just a second. Oh God, where'd the chat go? What did I do? Oh, there it is. Uh, sorry. So here is the YouTube link. Um, it's to an entire um, composting um, webinar that I did similar to this. Um, but at about the 34 and 32nd mark is where the video starts. So 34, about 34 minutes, you'll find the video. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. And again, thank you everyone for attending. Please let us know, as always, if there are any questions. Uh, and we hope to hear from you soon. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone.